Energy in America, we should never underestimate its, its, uh, its role in America going forward. And we have Lou Pugliarisi, uh, our correspondent and the uh, CEO of EPRINC, uh, an energy think tank in Washington, D.C., to help us understand these macro issues. Welcome back to your show, Lou. Be here, Jay. <laughs> Just in from Japan a few hours ago. Oh, that's great. I want to carry your bag next time. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you're doing so many great things, and I, I love to follow your travels, your adventures, and the lessons you learn. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I, this is a great topic for us to discuss. We're calling it, to what extent is energy a factor in these campaigns? Energy and the elections to come. It's, what, 15, 18 months ago, away, and it's not very far. And, you know, yeah, you can see it the, warming up. The working title for this would be, will the Green New Deal elect Donald Trump? Yes, right. Well, yeah. Or, or could could a Green New Deal hand the election to Donald Trump? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so what do you think? What about that? So I think what we ought to do is, um, you know, I'm quite stunned at watching the Democratic debates of the lack of any, any moderation among the candidates. Uh, yeah, I guess you could say Joe Biden is, is at least in the close to the center, but that, uh, and you know, I understand that the way these elections work is that you try to work your base to get the, uh, to get uh, the nomination and then you drive to the center to uh, try to win the election. But I actually think they've gotten them, some of these candidates have gotten themselves so far out on the limb, it's going to be pretty hard to get back to the center. So yeah. It's not, it's not just, easy to change your position, as we've yeah, seen yeah, I mean, with Kamala Harris. Right. It's not easy. So I thought we would just take a look at the new, uh, I guess, the Green New Deal, not the New Green Deal, but the Green New Deal, just a small few pieces of it and talk about why not only is it very unrealistic and kind of pie in the sky, but why it is likely to cause a huge backlash among a lot of the constituents that they're trying to get to vote for them. Um, and uh, we can talk about uh, some aspects of this, but I do think the proponents of this program are going to be subject to a lot of ridicule and actually frightening, frightening counterattacks. So, uh -huh. so maybe we should go to the first uh, image here. Okay, let's do that. And this is, uh, you know, AOC or <laughs> Anastasia <laughs> Cortez. Uh, she's, uh, she's really, she's speaking stridently, I can tell from the photograph. Right. And so if you look at the now these some of these uh, some of these positions or the compositions of the Green New Deal are under debate. But basically it talks, you know, if, if from what we understand, it requires uh, or at least uh, as an objective, the elimination of all cows, because I don't know if your audience is aware, cows uh, uh, emit quite a bit of ethane, methane. Um, so. So that is a problem for those worried about climate. Then uh, the Green New Deal also provides subsidies for those unwilling to work. <laughs> you could say people who don't find jobs unwilling to work. 100% of power demand through clean, renewable uh, you know, three, uh, energy sources. Upgrade all existing buildings with energy efficiency technology. And of course, all of these goals should com be, be completed uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, and the reason why I think this is kind of important is the U.S. has become a major oil and gas producer. It is now the largest oil and gas producer in the world. And I'm going to show you why even in areas where you might be able to get renewables for a little more, than these actually generally it will be a lot more expensive. Uh, you're going to lose something else. And that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit. It's called economic rent. Mm -hmm. And this economic rent has value to society because people can use it to do things like build schools and roads and uh, mental health clinics, things like that. 
Um, so if we go to the next, the next kind of uh, picture here, graph, um, I think that it's very interesting to see that there is a kind of radicalism in the implementation strategy, right? Uh, we, what they want is a Manhattan-style project uh, of clean energy sources to immediately stop burning fossil fuels. And then this quote I really like, uh, we need to ditch the patriarchal models of wealth right, and status reproduction that have been con that have been constitu constitutive of nearly all expansionist war making and resource depleting societies of the past 10,000 years. <laughs> so I thought wow, that this- that's uh, pretty heavy stuff. Yeah, and I, I just think before, before we get, I'm, I'm gonna get, show you a nice little picture here uh, coming up in a second, but I don't think people understand. Producers, last year, I looked this up today. Last year, producers, refiners, and marketers of oil and gas spent about $184 billion in new capital investment. That's one year. The utility industry spent $131 billion last year. It was not all on green. Very little of this went to, some of it went to green in the utility sector, but most of it went to kind of, uh, you know, making the existing uh, capital base more efficient maybe substituting out some coal for gas and uh, but these are colossal amounts of money i mean if you think about the stimulus package alone right for the 2008 recession which was considered a huge number was you know that came just under 50 billion for energy programs and that well, was this a is special, huge yeah yeah so so you, th these numbers are big and these capital outlays occur every year right so well, why, why are we spending so much you say upgrade, make more efficient. Um, we it have to sounds spend like this an money. awful lot of money just to do that. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of money, but we're a big country and we use a lot of energy. And yeah. if you if you look at the... So one of the things I want to talk about, though, before... Uh, there's a couple of other things, but let's go to the next picture, the next... Uh, and you see, this is a quite... I think this is really interesting. Now, I don't know if you know that the state of New Mexico, it's dominated by the Demo by Democratic uh, Party, and it has a very active uh, uh, initiative to ban all fracking, you know, because fracking's bad, right? And I found this picture, which I think is interesting. Not too long ago, not too long ago, at the begin sometime last year, the Interior Department, you know, the state of New Mexico, Mexico has a great deal of public lands, mm -hmm. held a lease sale, that is a bid, for the rights to produce oil and gas from public land in New Mexico, right? The sum of those high bids came to $1 billion. But under the, under the sort of revenue sharing laws of the Congress, a big chunk of that money went to the state of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, you can see the picture of this check. A relatively low-level Interior Department official is handing a check to an even lower-level set of county officials for $486 million. And so the reason why this is important is because this conventional um, fuel source, energy source, oil and gas, has in it a lot of economic rent. And that is its value to society. Its value to society far exceeds its cost of production in many cases. Mm -hmm. And in the case where there are public lands, the government collects this extra value. And so if you want to have a program to get rid of this, someone needs to go look at that check and say, well, gee, what could I do with that money? I could build schools. I could take care of old people. I can have health clinics. I can... Uh, I can take care of people who don't want to work. <laughs> you can do a lot. And so any decision to transform American society out of uh, these traditional energy sources into these fuels of the future probably mean moving to a set of fuels which are relatively expensive and have little or no rent. Actually, in many cases, they will require subsidies. And so it's not just the cost of the of production of these alternative fuels. It's what are we gonna do with the 
what do we do about the loss of this economic rent? What we call, it's a kind of term of art among economists. And this exists all through American society now because we are the largest oil and gas producer in the world. Have you, so mentioned, the, have you mentioned the cost of changing out the infrastructure? of transitioning to new systems? No, we're not even getting to that. That's going to be, we know in the, in the, there's a lot of discussion, particularly for the electric grid, it can be quite expensive. But just think about the cost of transitioning the entire uh, auto fleet to electric cars or all the, all the other aspects that we use oil and gas for in the petrochemical industry. And, uh, the, the, how are we going to distribute these new supplies, however they might be? So I think that, of course, you can argue that Green New Deal is just a silly idea and it's not going to go anywhere. But I do think a number of very prominent politicians are now promoting it. And I think they're not, you know, they haven't really had a chance to confront it. I actually don't think it would have much chance, even if it, even if one of the candidates won. I, I don't think in the Congress it would get very far. But let me let me uh, let me uh, add this though. I mean, we had a yeah, yeah. millennial on the show last hour, and yeah. what, what she was saying, she's 27 years old, local, um, yeah, and and very articulate and smart. What she was saying is, my generation is willing to make a compromise. We know we have to change things. We know we're going to suffer a certain amount of discomfort, um, and you know, and and you know, change is hard. Change is painful. We know that. We're willing to do that. Now, I'm not sure that's true for everyone, or or for her entire generation, but there are those so, people out there that are saying, you know, I OAC may be unrealistic, and certainly this this uh, green energy plan that sounds green new deal plan sounds unrealistic. But it becomes more realistic if everybody gets out there and says, we know it's painful, we're willing to suffer it. Uh, well, I, wait I don't a know minute. if this, I see that young... political will, but... but... <laughs> <laughs> so this young woman lives on the Hawaii, somewhere on the Hawaiian Islands, I think. Yes. Right. So if it gets too hot, she opens the window. And if it gets too cold, she closes the window. Okay? <laughs> I'm not really thinking. I don't know what sacrifice she's talking about. Okay? <laughs> if she lived in the Central Valley of California, right, we have people who, when it gets too hot, they can't afford the electricity. They have to go to the Walmart to cool off. Okay. Oh my God. So I, I, I think, <laughs> and we do have people who don't make a lot of money, and who high electricity prices is a huge problem. Okay. And we do. We've talked about this before. The California has as, as close to a new green deal as anybody, in in uh, many ways. And we know that the price of electricity has risen over the last 10 to 15 years, five times faster in California than it has in the rest of the country. And that gasoline prices are about a dollar more than the rest of the country. Now, for lots of Californians who have high incomes and live in the coastal regions, that's not a problem. Uh, but for a lot of Californians, it's a severe problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want to get too far off track here, but this is an exotic program, a very complicated program. And I always wonder, you know, I think before the governments take on these very complex programs, they ought to show us that they can take care of the homelessness, that they can prevent dams from uh, coming apart, and they can keep the road system and the transit system operating, you know. I mean, I, th I just think there should be some requirement on part of the government to show that it can functionally deliver the basic services before they go ahead and sign up for these more uh, exotic programs. But yeah, yeah, oh, that's very important. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, those those are the things we depend on for, sometimes for life yeah. itself. And so that's why I think this this. This very, you know, I could we could do a lots of analysis with charts and graphs, but seeing seeing this government, federal officials handing this monster check to the state of New Mexico, <laughs> I think it brings it all home for me. Sure. <laughs> so uh, wh where do we go from here? You have another slide that points this out? Yeah, yeah, we, we can go through. There's two, there's only two more. Uh, this, this is a slide, I think, uh, a lot of people don't understand the scale and scope 
of the uh, American kind of energy infrastructure. This kind of elaborate slide with all these bubbles show you all the natural gas. They show all the kind of pipeline. They don't really show all the pipeline. They show the major pipeline networks and then all the distribution hubs for natural gas in the United States. Okay. That is a massive investment. It's worth, you know, probably several hundred billion dollars, if not close to a trillion dollars in capital investment. Are you really going to abandon this actually functional uh, energy complex in a, in a few years? And do you really think you can abandon it without any kind of serious uh, economic consequences? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think, and, and once again, to get back to the politics of that, I think if, in fact, one of the Democratic candidates really embraces this, and I, I don't think, and it's quite possible Biden's not going to make it, you know, but I think Biden is probably, you know, he's probably a center left guy, but he's going to be commonsensical. But if Kamala Harris or Elizabeth Warden get, and they run with this, I think there's just going to be a big, big bullseye for Trump. <laughs> and he's going to start talking about this and scare, and the American people are going to get scared. Well, and I mean, they ought to be scared. Part of this, part of this is, um, you know, the fact that he has, he has not really endorsed renewables. He has not endorsed clean energy. And when he, when he gets a chance, he uh, tries to, um, you know, incentivize coal yet again. And um, I mean, I, you know, I mean, speaking as somebody who uh, at least is, um, you know, interested in and wants to see uh, renewables uh, succeed, maybe not at the same speed as uh, OAC does, but ultimately <laughs> succeed. I, I, I have a lot of trouble with Trump going back yeah. to coal because I, mean, I, I consider but, him uh, ill-educated or and ill-motivated on the subject. So people like me so, are not. I'm not. I don't think that she's going to hand the election to him on that basis. <laughs> she's going to have to come up with a better plan. So it's a dynamic, yeah. Lou, and I want to offer you the yeah. two possible dynamics. One is OAC gets more realistic and, and her friends. And the other is Trump gets more moderate about renewable energy. These two possibilities uh, yeah. may happen. So I think the re first let's talk about the reality. In the po electric power sector, the federal government is a very minor player. Uh, renewable fuel, renewable portfolio standards, uh, what you have in the state of Hawaii under Governor Ng and 100% uh, renewable. These are driven by state or regional transmission, uh, you know, uh, offices or, or you know, organizations, and not by the federal government. In fact, in all the modeling on the clean power plan for which we participated in, there was almost very little difference between what Obama tried to do with Obama's clean power plan and without his clean clean power. Plan. I mean, you you, I just tell you that the error term around the where you ended up swamped any point estimate because the relative price of coal versus gas was driving the coal out even though in many cases the coal was cheaper uh let's say when it there i as far as i know in the last 10 years no utility in the united states has built a new coal plant we're just talking about the pace at which the coal retirements uh, occur right so so it's hard to now i i don't agree i think <laughs> i think the way trump uses twitter and the way he talks to the american people is very counterproductive i don't know whether he's an evil genius or or if just he's a wacky he's got his wacky guy with some kind of crazy ideas on this stuff but the he does appeal to a certain number of people enough apparently in the last election to win which say you know he's right you know all these crazy people in washington they're not talking to me they're talking to all their friends at the universities and all these elites in new york and they don't have a clue about how i live my life and i think he you know you could argue that he sort of understands that and that's what he's he's just operating as a political animal 
And uh, well, I think that's, that's true. That's he's, not, he's connecting with that's them. Not an, that's not an efficient way to proceed either. I, I agree with you. And, and, and their numbers are increasing. Last, last number I heard is a 47% approval rate for him. It's approval rate. It's incredible. I mean, let's say in any, if you, any political analysis, the United, uh, the, uh, a normal president with this kind of national economy would be at 55 or 60%. Mm -hmm. It's strictly Trump's behavior, his uh, commentary, and you could argue his character that's holding him back, in my mm -hmm. view. And well, all the major political models. Yeah, it's so interesting that he will the, win. the young people, let's call them the millennials, and the ones who yeah, are yeah. not in the, in the red states per se and form that, that red right. base of his, um, yeah. they have a completely different view of the world than he does. On so many issues, and there's, you know, they're they're completely, you know, turned off by what he does every single day. Um, I I agree, I agree, and but I think the opposition has to present something that, uh, you know, that addresses the fundamental fundamental issues of the national economy and job security, and. Uh, a lot of other concerns that have broad appeal in the American electorate. And, uh, you know, climate is, not, I mean, I, my view is that we're going to be much better off when we get to the point where climate issues are a technocratic issue and not a religious issue. As long yes. as it remains a religious issue, I cannot, I cannot talk to anyone. If it's a technocratic issue, then we can talk about, okay, how yes. do we get on the, the gradient that is least cost, that doesn't sort of bankrupt the country, that is robust against uncertainty. We, we can start talking about those things. You know. And I, then finally, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. I, I worry so that, that the climate's going to catch up with us, though. Uh, and, and it could yeah, be on, I think on a sudden worth, death basis. You know. So, but we do have some research on that, which suggests that uh, most of the a lot of the discussion of it is quite alarmist. In other words, climate is a technocratic problem. It is a problem. It is in my mind. I don't think the data supports it, including the non-Trump touched uh, worst case scenario that the interagency process generated. It is not an existential threat. Okay, it's the, the earth is not going to explode in a big fireball in 10 years. I mean, that's just, and I think if you present this to the American people this way, they're going to not listen. That's why it's, you know, they, people keep saying this, it's the end of the world. And people say, well, okay, it's hot, but, you know, is it really the end of the world? Well, I, you know, if there is extreme weather in a given, you know, what, what is it? Somebody said that there is another climate change incident in this country every week, every single week. It's, so uh, I don't know who said that. That's more than it was before. And, and I yeah, suggest that all we need is one really bad one, and the subject <laughs> and the discussion will change. I got it. But if you are a hard data person, the only research that I have seen on this at NCAR out in Colorado by a group of four eminent scientists, Pelkey, who led that uh, research, they cannot find, for example, for hurricanes and typhoons, they cannot find an increase in the incidence and the severity over the last hundred years. They just can't find it. Yeah, you can have colossal damage to these things, partly because people are building in places that used to get hit by them before, mm -hmm. and uh, there was nobody there, so there was no damage. And so I, I think, uh, yeah, we have a, the climate is a problem, right? It is not in my opinion, an existential threat. Well, let me ask but you this. But it's a problem. Let me, let me ask you this. You, you, you know, we talked about OAC and the New Green Deal. We talked about the yeah. economy. We talked about how, you know, unrealistic some of those points on our New Green Deal are. Yeah. That they'll never, they'll never be adopted, but, uh, you know, they're not, they're not good policy either in view of, uh, you know, other needs of various constituencies in the country. But if you yeah. integrate, you know, your thinking, your research, and the political... Mm, the political factors that are in play and that are likely to continue to be in play in the next uh, 
18 months, what do you get? If, if, if you were advising the, the president or, for example, all these uh, you know, Democratic hopefuls as well, uh, what would you say the best platform would be on energy to get them elected? What, what should they espouse at this point to um, you know, cross the board, you know, to, to bring, in, bring in both sides to the middle and sort of try to satisfy everybody's concerns and everybody's sense of reality? Yeah, so if you look at sort of what I would call responsible Democrats, right, like uh, the former Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, has this Energy Futures Initiative, and, uh, and you sort of think about, okay, we can't really go and we're not, nobody is going to agree to live in a cave. We have to accept that. And that if this stuff is too costly, the Amer American people will balk against it. And people say they're willing to sacrifice. Okay, well, how much? Let's test, go do a little survey on the streets of Honolulu and ask them, okay, I've got a plan for Hawaii. It's fantastic. It's only going to cost you $1,000 more a year. Uh, I know you're a good Democrat and you're ready to sacrifice. Can I sign you up? I just want you to go. Go down to your local Starbucks and just try that out next week, okay? And let me know what you what you what kind of results you get. We should try that. I would be so yeah. interested in that. And, and tell them they need to give you a hundred dollars to get it started. <laughs> or how about five thousand so or ten thousand? So you know. <laughs> yeah, and so and I think the thing is, is that all right? So if you're going to do this, you can't give up on nuclear power, right? Nuclear power is clean. It's uh, it doesn't emit anything. And all these, these, so if you abandon all kinds of what we know works and you just sort of want to run on a bunch of slogans, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. You may even lose the election. You could win the election with slogans. I agree. I agree. You can win. Lots of wacky people have been made president before. Trump is not the first one. <laughs> do, you, do you think, you know, here's, here's one thing that I, I would like to pose to you. Do you think that energy is that important in the mind of the electorate? I'm not really sure it is. I'm not sure they understand. No, it. as they a percent know about of, of gross energy is is prolific, and in the United States, relatively cheap. As a percent, I would be surprised if the entire percent of gross of disposable income dedicated to energy, including gasoline, I doubt it exceeds 10 percent of most Americans. Uh, income, disposable income. That's amazing if you think about it. When mm -hmm. you went back in history, food and energy probably consumed half of income. So in the productivity of the world and the United States economy especially has made it cheap and plentiful. So we have room to do some things as long as they're not too wasteful. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I just think it's, uh, I, I don't hear that much discussion over it at these And debates. we should put a lot of, yeah. And we should put a lot of money into research. I don't have a problem with that. We should put a lot of money. That's the kind of Bill Gates strategy. Look, I mean, what Gates and what these big, you know, these big billionaires who are thoughtful and giving away their money, what they're saying is, look, we have to have technologies that are competitive. That's how we're going to transform society, through technology. Not through command and control, not through sort of forcing, uh, you know, the whole world to move onto something that is unrealistically operationally and in cost-wise. And you can see by the last, we can go quickly look at the last picture, something we're very interested in bring. And you can see here that uh, the growth of uh, LNG worldwide is now you know virtually exploding that means that the large supplies of gas from the united states uh, west africa australia are now making their way to all these destinations around the world where uh where they can be used to back out coal and heavy fuel oil and that's why i get kind of upset with AOC and a lot of folks saying, well, you need to get rid of the gas. You need to get rid of the oil and get rid of the gas. No, we have to get on the gradient. Right? You can't just do it overnight. This is the U. And by the way, 
although U.S. Uh, CO2 emissions were up last year, over the last 10 years, the U.S. is probably, in the, I'm sure of this, the U.S. is the best performing large economy in reducing CO2 emissions by far. Mm -hmm. We have reduced emissions, I think, up to, I will send you the data on it, but 2 to 3% a year per annum for the last 10 to 12 years. We did have a bump upward last year, having to do sort of some unique conditions. American well, I come, I come away with two thoughts on this. One is uh, yeah. we don't yet know uh, how much of a role energy is going to play. And uh, I think that uh, uh, AOC's program, the New Green Deal, um, it needs a lot of work. And I think I agree with you that if she sticks on those points, um, it's, it's going to work in, in Trump's favor because he's, he's yeah, going to be able to gonna argue it's all uh, unrealistic. But the other thing is mean, strikes me is that from our discussion is that we need to plan these things from the technology on out uh, and it's not only a matter of planning you know the the type of resource you have or or what the yeah. grid is made of or the electronics it's a matter of looking at every step you take as against the economy and other things that government has to do and i don't think we're doing that i think we're limiting ourselves to planning in silos don't you agree no, I absolutely agree. And I think we need to have a more honest conversation. You can't, as my wife always says when we go to a party, don't talk about climate. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we, have one, we have one guy who comes on from the School of Journalism. He says, that's the only thing to talk about. <laughs> he always, don't talk about climate. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, it's great to talk to you. Uh, Let's get to together you, in two weeks' time, assuming we can find you on the on the planet. <laughs> so, two weeks' time, uh, yes. I might be in Mexico City, but I will be able to do it. Okay, well, they have broadband down okay. there, I know. All right. Yeah, yeah, they do. <laughs> Thank you, Lou Pulzirisi, uh, right. CEO of ePrink, joining us from Washington about energy policy and how they will yeah. that policy will affect the elections coming soon. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you, Jay. Thank <laughs> you.